Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Lori Thomas. Uh, I head up uh, community groups here and re-engage marriage ministry and uh, do some admi admin work also. Um, today's reading is going to be from Acts chapter 16, uh, verse, verses 16 through 34. And as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to, the, said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and grabbed, dragged them to the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, they, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Then when the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell before, uh, down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once. He was he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house, set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I want to begin by saying thank you to all of you ladies who helped uh, make the IF gathering happen. Many of you came and served and uh, helped out in various ways, and I was not here, but I heard it was a wonderful success. My wife and my daughter came home uh, just raving about the time, not just of, of listening to speakers, but uh, of being with uh, the ladies here. So again, I want to say thank you for that. Uh, this week, we're going to be looking at a, a unique section here in Acts where the gospel comes to a new city. And sometimes as I read scripture, I try to place myself there or maybe to understand more about God. It's a little bit hard to understand, like um, maybe identify with the people or to know exactly how God would be relating in those circumstances. But one of the things that I've been doing in, in the mornings, y'all, I'm getting old and so I have these weird like patterns that I have to follow in my life, kind of have to do the same thing every day. And so I get up at 530 every morning and I spend time in prayer uh, first, praying for me and my wife, my family, you guys, our church, our city, all kind of all the things that you know I'm going to run through and pray for. And then I spend time in the Word, and there's a unique, a couple of unique things. One confessional, um, when I'm done uh, praying and reading my Bible, I do the Wordle every day, 69-day streak going on. So uh, if yeah, it's, that's going well. Uh, but another thing that I've been doing is I look back to, I, I keep my photos in the cloud, and it reminds me, like your memories from years past. And I have a lot of pictures of my kids that come up as a result, and as, as I have done that uh, and, and I think upon uh, the love that I have for my kids and the desires that I have for them, like the hopes that I have for my boys and for my daughter, who they can become as uh, men and, and a, you know, a woman, like, oh, it just stirs my heart and it reminds me uh, of how much I, I love them and, and also of how much God loves us. This is my picture that I saw this morning. I think I have it up there. Uh, my three kids, this is a few years ago at our old house. Aren't they cute, right? And 
son's missing teeth. Uh, he's slightly older now. I like to look back on those, but it reminds me of how much I love my kids. And it reminds me of how much God loves us. Um, if you're here today, I want you to know that you were created in the image of God. And that God loves you deeply. And in the same way that there's nowhere that I wouldn't go for my kids, nothing I wouldn't do for them, the same is true for God. And the same is true for you. Um, he loves you as his own children. As we look into Acts chapter 16 today, we're going to see three different people um, as the gospel came to the city of Philippi. Three different people that have encounters with God and, and what he does for them. And I hope that you leave here today understanding how much God loves you and ultimately what I believe that God wants to do in your life. So we're going to begin in chapter 11 of Acts 16 uh, Paul uh, has gone with Silas. He picked up Timothy on the way. Uh, you're going to see in this passage a bit of a transformation in the language, uh, whereas before, up to this point in the book, you've heard uh, the author talk about Paul or Timothy or Peter or whoever it was. He's now going to start using the term we. And so the author of Luke, the writer of the book, is now with Paul and Silas and Timothy in the city of Philippi. So look here in verse 11. It says, So setting sail from Troas, we made direct voyage to Samothrace, and we followed uh, in the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, and a Roman colony. Now we remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went out to the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her whole household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. And so this is interesting, the gospel going to a new place. In the city of Philippi, there wasn't even a synagogue, which is if you had 10 Jewish men, you could uh, constitute a synagogue, if you will. And, and there weren't 10 Jewish men in the city of Philippi. As a matter of fact, we don't find any men who have any knowledge of God whatsoever there. Uh, but rather, when the Apostle Paul went to the city and he wants to begin preaching, um, no synagogue, he goes outside the city to a riverside. He just finds some women praying. Now, one of the women that he finds is named Lydia. And she must have been a rather prominent woman. Oftentimes in the Bible, uh, we don't see the names of people listed, right? Um, it would have stood to... to it's a reason that maybe uh, people wouldn't have known who they were, so why bother to include their names, right? But this woman, Lydia, is listed by name. It was likely that she was prominent. She was a seller of purple, and the, basically the dye to make the garments purple was very, very expensive. And so Lydia uh, must have had some means. She must have been a woman of wealth. She dealt in textiles that would have been purple. Uh, and as a result, if the textiles, the clothing... Um, if it was very expensive, that would mean that she had a fairly exclusive clientele. It wasn't your average Joe that could afford the things that Lydia was selling. So Lydia would have been a woman of prominence. She was someone who was known. She would have been wealthy. We're going to see here that she had a house big enough uh, to house Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke and anyone else who might have been traveling with them. And then later we're going to see that she hosted the church in her home. So first century, uh, there's not a building like this. There's no sound system or lighting, right? No comfortable chairs like we have here. It was somebody's home. And people would gather anywhere they could, you know, find a place. And there would be preaching of the word. They would sing together. That was church then. So Lydia's home was probably uh, fairly well appointed. It was a nice, spacious place. So you have a lady who's, who's got some things going for her in her life. This woman, Lydia, who most people would have looked at her and, and recognized that she had, a, she had some things going on. She had her life on track. She's noteworthy. She's prominent. She's got some wealth. Uh, she's got the right friends. She knows some people. She's well-connected in her community. And yet what we see about Lydia is that even though she had a lot of things going right for her in her life. At some point, she had come to recognize that her wealth or her status or her connections, um, they weren't enough. And so we see her described here as a, a worshiper of God, and yet she was not a believer in Jesus. There weren't even Jews in the city, right? 
She was not uh, someone who would have understood all of the Old Testament and, and the things of who God was then. Uh, she was someone who was a seeker. She recognized that something was missing in her life, and she was seeking after something. And so we find her out by this riverside at a place of prayer. Um, it's likely that she's decided to live a moral and devout life, but again, she doesn't know who Jesus is. Her heart has not yet been transformed. In verse 14, <clears throat> excuse me, it says, one, uh, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, the seller of purple. And then it goes on to say, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Now, sometimes when we attempt to translate things from, in this case, Greek to English, we don't get the full sense of what it meant by pay attention. And it's not just what I want my kids to do when I tell them to do something, right? Uh, this word, pay attention, is the Greek word prosecco, which means devote herself. Uh, as a matter of fact, this word was used to describe people who were addicted to wine, like, it's not like she paid attention one time to the gospel and, you know, she heard it and then went away. But rather, this was a level of devotion and dedication that developed in her heart upon hearing the message that the Apostle Paul had preached. She and her whole household were baptized. If you were to fast forward and read Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, you need to know that it began meeting in the house of this woman, Lydia, this prominent lady who was well-connected, had lots of money, but realized there was still something missing in her life and began to seek after something uh, for meaning. So what, the first point I want you to know this morning is that um, there is hope for the seeker. Maybe you're here today and your life is a little bit like Lydia's. On the outside, if people were to look at you, they would say, hey, here's a man, here's a woman who has some things going really well for them well put together, they're managing their life well, things seem to be trending in all the right directions for them, uh, they know the right people, they're doing the right things, and yet, uh, as you sit here today, uh, maybe you find that similar discontent in your heart. Even though outwardly things are going really well inwardly, you still find yourself recognizing that something is missing. Maybe you've been trying, or quietly trying to figure God out trying to figure out uh, what it is that's leaving you empty inside your life. Maybe you're like Lydia. I want you to know that there is hope for the seeker because we have a God who loves us even more than we love our children. And he's coming after us and he wants good things for us. He wants us to know true joy and true abundance. And in the same way that on a random day in the city of Philippi, God sent the Apostle Paul and his associates to preach the gospel to a woman in a place of prayer. Uh, I would want you to know that uh, here today, God is pursuing your heart as well. And he would want you to know that he loves you. He would want you to know that he died on the cross for you, that you might find fullness of life. So there is hope for the seeker, but that's not where it stops. In verse 16, we have the account of the slave girl, um, it says in verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. And she brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaimed to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Now, at first, I wonder how this felt to Paul and Silas. You know, if you're going to go preach to people, it kind of helps to have someone who is a fortune teller who's letting people know these men are servants of the Most High God. They're proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Um, but day after day, this got a little bit irritating. And we see that Paul, verse 18, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Christ Jesus to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Now, this young slave girl is really the polar opposite of Lydia. She's clearly not well-connected. She's not a person of prominence. We're not given her name. She didn't have uh, wealth or means or abundant possessions. As a matter of fact, this slave girl was actually possessed herself. And don't lose sight of this. To, to be a slave in the first century likely meant that this girl's parents, maybe she'd fallen into disfavor, maybe they had a difficult financial situation. Um, it's likely that this young girl's parents, and, and when you hear this young girl, she was probably around 14 years old. 
at some point, she'd fallen out of favor with her family or they came on financial difficulty and they had decided to sell her into slavery. She's not like Lydia. She's not wealthy and prominent and known and all these things. As a matter of fact, she's owned by somebody else. She was, in a sense, abandoned by her family or not wanted by them. She'd been exchanged for money or property or to pay a debt. She herself wasn't just possessed by these masters that had bought her. She was also possessed by a spirit of divination. Now, um, in the Greek, there's two words here, spirit of divination. The word spirit is pneuma. Um, divination here is the word python, which you might think, oh yeah, it's a snake. Well, that's exactly what you would have understood if you were in Philippi at the time. Um, there was, in pagan mythology, uh, Python was the name of the snake that um, it basically was said to inhabit the underworld. It was the snake that uh, was said to have possessed the oracle of Delphi. You may have heard of this uh, in terms of telling fortunes or being clairvoyant. Um, and this snake, this python, was said to inhabit her. Um, those whom python possessed became his mouthpieces. And so they would uh, utter words that were beyond their control. Now, this had been really profitable for her masters because apparently the things she was saying were actually coming true. And so if that happens once, you go back to her, right? And so she's making her masters a lot of money. But she's possessed with this spirit such that not even her words are her own. This is a really difficult existence. You're owned by somebody else. You don't have anything belonging to yourself. Not even your words are your own, but rather you're possessed by a spirit that makes you speak. She finds herself yelling. It's, the Greek word is shrieking before Paul and Silas when they went to preach. These men are servants of the Most High God. They're proclaiming to you the way of salvation. And yet on this day, the God who loved her when other people didn't, the God who wanted her when she'd been rejected, the God who saw value in her far beyond what she could profit people, was coming after her. And in the name of Jesus Christ, this spirit of divination was cast from her. Now maybe you, you don't identify with Lydia. You're not a person of prominence. You don't have all of your stuff together. People don't look at you and want to be like you or want to have the friends that you have. Maybe you feel more like the slave girl. Maybe you too were cast aside or were unwanted. Maybe you feel unloved. Maybe you've been used and abused in your life. Maybe you don't have an evil spirit, but maybe something has a hold on you that you can't seem to escape either. For you, maybe it's your past, either the things you've done or things that have been done to you that you can't seem to get past. Maybe it's regret. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe it's emptiness. Maybe it's struggles with your sexuality, with greed or envy or bitterness or unforgiveness. If you feel maybe a little bit like the slave girl, I want you to know that there is hope for the slave because this young girl was set free. Because the God of the universe loves us even more than we love our children or those closest to us. And the God of the universe has come and he wants to set you free and he wants to give you new life. There is hope for the seeker and there is hope for the slave. But that's not where this story ends. There's another person that we get introduced to, and he's a jailer. Um, in, in Rome, those who would occupy civil positions were usually former soldiers. You know how it is, fellas. You get a little bit older. Um, you can't maybe perform at the level that you used to perform, and they would put you in a, a gentler job, if you will. Not that being a jailer was gentler. Uh, but this, this man, he finds himself the head of the jail, and he's given some very specific instructions. After they had beaten uh, Paul and Silas with rods, they would have been bloodied and bruised. They might have even had broken bones. They give the command uh, in, in verse uh, 23. So they ordered the jailer to keep them safely. 
Again, this word safely doesn't really give um, the full sense of the word. It's not like, hey, keep these guys safe. It was, hey, here's a very direct command to you. We don't want anything to happen to these guys. We want you to watch them very carefully. And so um, verse 24, having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, you might have been to a theme park and, you know, you took the picture with your, you know, your arms and legs and the stocks and, and you know, that sort of thing. Um, these stocks were likely more of a device of pain, more of a device of almost torture where your legs would be splayed out and these men who had been beaten with rods, perhaps even with broken bones and their wounds are still open, they haven't been cleaned. Uh, they were placed in the inner prison by this jailer and they were placed there in such a way that they would have felt absolutely defeated. Uh, their muscles would have cramped and left them in agony. They would have been able to stretch out or to move. This was a really painful experience for Paul and Silas. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Uh, when you worked for Rome and you were a jailer, you had one job, and that was to not let the prisoners escape. And if you did, it was punishable by death. This man and about being about to kill himself, was simply preferring uh, death at his own hands to death at the hands of the Romans. But Paul cries out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Now the jailer, uh, an interesting guy, we're not told anything about his religious affinity. I mean, you have Lydia, who was in a sense seeking after God. She just didn't know the truth yet. We have the slave girl who's possessed by a demon, but at least is declaring the truth about who Paul and Silas were and the way to salvation. This man, we get nothing uh, of where he is. It, it's likely that this man wasn't all, cons all that concerned about who God was or uh, about God. He probably believed in God just because it was very common for the Greeks and the Romans to believe in God of some sort. Uh, but it doesn't seem that he was all that concerned with it. He didn't stop to inquire from Paul and Silas about the truth of the word, and there's really no evidence that they were preaching to them. So this man might have been kind of an average guy, not all that rich or wealthy like Lydia, and not enslaved like the slave girl. But he's a Roman, he's a jailer, he's probably getting by, he's an average ordinary person who we might consider or classify as agnostic or a skeptic, if you will, just not really sure about who God is or how he works in the world. A few things to, to look at here. This man had been ordered to keep them safely. And as a Roman soldier, this wouldn't have been a big task for him. He was well-trained, and he was seasoned. Um, he had a lot of confidence in his jail. It's evidenced by the fact that we find him sleeping in the story. Now, if you've been warned, on, and if you fail, it's punishable by death, that you better keep these guys safely, um, I'm not going to sleep at night unless I'm pretty confident that they're held safely. And he was. They were brought not just to the prison, but into the inner rooms of the prison where they could be held. There would have been multiple doors separating them from freedom. And then they were bound with chains. They were put into the stocks. Uh, this man had done his job just like he knew how to do. And he went to sleep because he wasn't worried about them escaping. However, this average guy who wasn't really seeking after God, he was about to encounter something unexpected and completely unexplainable in his life. There was an earthquake. And it, just to read this account, you've got to see where it, it might have stood out to him, right? Um, there was an earthquake in verse uh, 27. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, um, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Like, what we don't see here is the confidence that this guy would have had in his prison. Think about prisoners. Minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, month after month, they were trying to escape because they're prisoners, right? That's what you do when you have nothing else to do. And so he'd, he'd seen it. 
He'd seen all the tricks. He'd, he knew all of the ways that they would try to get out. And he knew that the doors were shut and that the chains were securely fashioned. And he's asleep. But then this earthquake happens. And not just a door. Because you can fathom. I mean, you think reasonably that an earthquake happens. You know, a door might rattle open. But this isn't just one door. It's all of the doors. Every door in the prison is wide open. And not only that... All of their chains, all of their bonds were unfastened. And again, maybe in an earthquake, a lock could open, something could happen. But every door and every lock, this, this man's encountering circumstances that he simply can't explain. I mean, that was kind of the first thing that he had to grapple with. But then this, this next one, it had to grip him even more. Like as he thought about this, it had to absolutely uh, be an unexplainable event in his life. Because look what happened. When he's about to take his own life, maybe he thought God was mad at him for jailing his messengers. I mean, he'd heard them singing. Maybe he'd heard about their teaching that had been in the city that God had put in jail in the first place. Maybe God was mad at him. So he wanted them to die, right? God's going to deliver his people and kill those who weren't his It was enough that the doors were open and all the chains fell off. But beyond that, when he calls for the lights and he rushes in, do you know what he finds? The messengers of God are still there. These men who have been beaten with rods, who would have had wounds all over them, perhaps even broken bones, he didn't take the time to clean their wounds. He didn't show them any mercy. He put them into the stocks that would have increased their suffering and their pain. And yet those men, rather than cursing him, he listened that night. They were praying and they were singing. And there's something just really unusual about that in the midst of suffering. But then when the doors are open and the chains fell off, and he's about to kill himself, Paul cries out with a loud voice like, Hey, don't harm yourself. We're still here. So he calls for the lights and he rushes in and he sees that the men are still there. And so maybe the bigger question for him is, why were the men still there? I mean, if God sent an earthquake to free them, why are they still in the jail? And I can't help but think there must have been some moment in which he realized maybe the earthquake wasn't for the messengers of God. Maybe the earthquake was for the jailer. And maybe in the midst of those unexplainable and unexpected circumstances, God was trying to show the jailer something that he wasn't even looking for. That God was trying to show the jailer that he loved him and that he was pursuing him and that he was absolutely real because the doors don't just open and the chains don't just fall off. And certainly men who have been beaten in, in a tortured way left in a Roman prison, they don't just hang out when they could have escaped. But, so maybe those circumstances weren't for Paul and Silas, but they were for this jailer, this skeptic, who wasn't seeking after God, who didn't even know how he felt about him. But then in this moment, you see his response. The jailer called for the lights and rushed in, trembling with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and the man who didn't show them mercy before now washes their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. He brought them up into his house, and he set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So maybe you're not like Lydia. The person of prominence, well-known, well-connected. Life's going just as it should. And maybe you're not like the slave girl where uh, you find yourself enslaved to something. Maybe you're addicted or whatever it be. Maybe you're just an average person. Maybe you're not all that interested in the things of God. But maybe like this jailer, this skeptic, you've encountered circumstances in your life that you simply can't explain. Mercies of God that you simply didn't deserve. Maybe you should have died and you didn't. Maybe in a moment of pain and anguish, you cried out to God for your loved one to be healed and they were healed. Or maybe there was one of a thousand different circumstances that you saw in your life and you simply can't explain. 
Maybe like the jailer, all your best efforts to manage your life and to handle your business have fallen short. Maybe you find your life outside of your own control, and maybe you find yourself against all reason being inclined toward trusting in Jesus. Here's what I want you to know. There is hope for the seeker, and there is hope for the slave, and there is hope for the skeptic. The final thing I want you to see is that there's hope for you. Wherever you are in your life, God loves you as his own child. He knows the pain. He knows the difficulty. He knows every thought, every struggle, every moment of of disappointment that you've ever experienced. God knows it. And he desires to come. He desires to save you. He desires to heal you. He desires to set you free from the thing that's been holding you back. God desires to do a profound work in your life. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. See, God loved you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in your place. See, the trouble for all of us in the midst of our brokenness, the reason we can't fix ourselves, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of the emptiness, even though everything is going like it should, uh, what we ultimately need is God. We need a relationship with our Creator. The the problem is because we have sinned against God and He's perfectly holy, uh, we can't have fellowship with Him. I mean, a perfectly holy and just God cannot have fellowship with a completely sinful person like you and me. And so God sends His Son, Jesus, to live that perfect life. And then to go to the cross to die in our place. The wages of our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so here's what Jesus did for you. For those of us who come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God takes all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our shame, and he placed that on his son Jesus. And there on the cross, Jesus bore the just punishment for our sin. He endured the punishment that you and I deserved. And for those of us who don't trust in ourselves anymore, who don't trust in our logic or our own reason, our ability to be good or to save ourselves, but we trust instead in Jesus Christ, God doesn't just atone for our sin there in the work of Jesus on the cross. He also credits to us the righteousness of Jesus so that no longer does sin stand between us and God, but we can now have fellowship with our Creator. We can know the one who created us. We can know the purpose for which He created us. We can have fellowship with Him, and we can know God's plans for our life. And that's the work of Jesus Christ for you and I. God loves you as His own child, and He is inviting you to believe in Him. And maybe for you, that's salvation for the first time. Maybe it's like, I'm trusting in Jesus. I've never done that before. I've I've always tried to make it my own way. And maybe for you, it's to trust Him again. And you've been a believer for a decade or two or three or more. But here you find yourself in the midst of pain or heartache or despair. And the invitation of Jesus is to believe upon Him, to trust in Him, to turn to Him that He might care for you. Because He's a good Father. Today, we're going to have a time of response here. Or I want to invite you to trust Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right now. Right there where you are, I want you to think about the thing that you're facing. Maybe it's emptiness inside. There's not been enough money or enough success or enough you know, fame or notoriety. It's, nothing's been able to fill that void. Today I want, to, I want to invite you to trust Jesus with that void in your life to fill you, to give you that life which is abundant that will finally and fully satisfy you. Maybe you're here and you feel like the slave. There's that addiction, that thing that has control of you. There's that bitterness, that unforgiveness, that pain. And you've been trying to work through it, but you cannot get free on your own. Today, I want to invite you to trust Jesus, to cry out to him, your heavenly father, to rescue you from that thing that has a hold on you. Maybe you're here and you've just been indifferent toward God. But God's been working in some ways, some unexplainable circumstances in your life, and He's begun drawing your heart to faith in Him. Right now, I want to invite you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to follow Him, to respond to Him 
in faith. I'm going to pray right now. I'm going to invite, ask you guys just to, to pray even as I do. Would you just cry out to God as I do the same on your behalf? Father, we want to acknowledge that we need you. God, in and of ourselves, that we can't uh, fulfill ourselves, we can't save ourselves, we can't make things better for ourselves. You're the one who does that for us. So Lord, for every man and woman and young person in this room today, we invite you to work on their behalf. Lord, I pray that just as you incline Lydia's ear to hear and be attentive to receive the gospel, I pray that that would happen across this building today. And Lord, may we not just receive the gospel once and then be done, but may we continue to walk in faith and following after you. I pray for healing to the person who needs to be healed. Lord, I pray the person who was unwanted and uncared for, that they would find, Lord, that you've been pursuing them, that you've wanted them, that you've claimed them as your own, you've adopted them as your child. Lord, I pray that today would be this day of salvation. We pray for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.